This is the Lotus Plant, and I command you to surrender your will to this episode of the Monkey's Pad. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dave Evans, and uh, in fact, I wrote the Frodo script. I don't command you to, but I invite you to join us with this episode of The Monkey's Pad, where we talk about the monkeys and have a lot of fun with those great guys from the 60s. I'd like to welcome writer Dave Evans to the Monkey's Pad. Dave, how are you today? Thank you for stopping good, in. Good, Joe. Good to be here. First of all, how did you become a writer on the Monkey Show? I got an agent who was an older guy at that point, and uh, I was a, just a young kid, and he was uh, uh, probably just about about to retire. And so he and I hit it off, and he he took me as as uh, his client. And one day. Uh, he came to me and he said, Dave, he said, I just saw a pilot for a new show that's going to be on in the fall. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's called The Monkeys. I think you'd be perfect for it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so uh, I went to see the pilot, fell in love with it, and uh, we got a meeting with Ward Sylvester, and I was trying to think, based on what I saw at the pilot, I, I uh, came up with a, a couple of stories. And I went in to uh, uh, meet with Ward, and I said, uh, I loved your pilot, and, and here is a story I uh, thought might kind of fit in uh, with uh, your show. And so I told him the story, and he said, it's exactly what we're looking for. And he hired me. And then I met Bert and Bob. And... Uh, you know, it was just a real formal sort of a interview. The other writers were all from New York, and I was uh, uh, actually from. I'm from Kansas. My dad's a Presbyterian minister. And I grew up in Kansas, so that's how I started on the monkeys. What was your first impression of Bert and Bob? Uh, Bob was kind of a scary guy. Bert was one of those guys that. He was a very young, extremely bright, um, very quiet, and very, uh, very elegant. He was, in addition to being a uh, producer of the Monkees, he was a vice president of Screen Jams, Columbia Pictures, and his father was president. So I was, I was, uh, you know, here I am a kid from Kansas, and uh, he was royalty, you know. They were very, uh, very impressive guys. One of the things that I loved about them, I don't know whose idea it was, but after we had, uh, you know, gotten hired and started, uh, Bert had a screening room. He said, this screening room is going to be available for you guys. Uh, and there was one woman, too. Uh, and it's going to be available for you for an entire week, 24 hours a day. You can come in here. Any time during the next week, uh, at, at at midnight, at, at three in the morning, at ten in the morning, and any time you want to, and it's available. Now, what we're doing, what we're screening continuously, is about five or six films that uh, were great, some of the great comedy classics. He had uh, Day at the Races uh, with uh, the Marx Brothers, uh, Night at the Opera, the Marx Brothers, Help. Uh, the Beatles and Hard Day's Night, the Beatles, and also The Knack, which was, I think, also done by uh, the, the two Beatles movies were directed. Richard, I think Richard Lester's film, yeah, right? Richard, and I now, think was he, this for the writers to watch, or were the monkeys also in on that? Just for the writers. And many times, uh, and I went in there quite a lot during that three days, and some days I'd be the only one there. And uh, he assembled us again, and he said, now, you guys have seen some of the greatest comedy films ever made. Now go out and write like that. Now, who were the other writers that you were in the stable there with? Well, uh, Jerry Gardner and Dee Caruso were the story editors. Uh, uh, Peter Meyerson 
uh, was one. Bob Schlitt was one. B Bernie Orenstein was another. David Panich was another. Uh, Peva Silverman and me. And that was it. That was the group. You wrote the first script not having met the monkeys, just based on what you saw on the pilot. Yeah. They became world famous very, very early on. And uh, it was just uh, an amazing transition that they had made. And yet, you know, they were, my experience was, they were always wonderful to me. They always, you know, were very, uh, uh, just very friendly, very open, very sharing. Uh, and they were just, they were just wonderful. They all became really good friends. They were radically different kind of people. And uh, they were wonderful. I remember I had this afternoon with Mike uh, while we were talking, and he was telling me about his growing up in uh, Texas. And uh, another time that was that that really struck me was uh, Davy. I was walking up the stairs to the second floor to the office, and Davy and a couple of girls were uh, walking down. And Davy had this great sweater on that had big big blue stripe blue and white stripes and i said it looked it really looked great and i said davy that's man that's a great sweater you've got and he just he and without he didn't break a step he just took it off and tossed it to me and uh but you know that was the way he was he was an amazingly generous person oh absolutely his entire life i've heard so many stories about how giving and generous he was. What's, give me a thumbnail sketch of each monkey as you perceived them at the time. Uh, oh, your wow. first impressions and... Uh, Davey, he was a, uh, just a wonderful person. Mickey was uh, very hyper, very out there. Mickey and Davey were the showmen. They were born to the stage and had that early experience in it. And you could see it. They really loved it. The others weren't as, as natural to performing as Davy and Mickey were. They were basically showmen. Davy was uncomplicated in a, in a way. Uh, he was very focused on being a, a fine musician and a fine performer and uh, the best one he possibly could, and he was great. And Peter, uh, I think, had wide-ranging interests. He sort of lived outside the realm of performance and was very interested in politics and and uh, he was an idea person and his range of interests was much wider than, uh, than Davies. But there, there was breadth to Peter's vision and contradiction actually too. And right. there was uh, there was a great, a great focus with, with Davies. When you say contradiction, what, what do you mean? Well, I think he went through different phases. He was exploring who he was as a person and, you know, kind of went through different phases, different uh, religious phases, different philosophical phases, different political phases, uh, and was constantly exploring where that would end up. And... Uh, was looking for himself in that very wide, wide-ranging search. Davy wasn't. Davy was just totally focused on his work, being a performer, doing, being a, doing a, a great job of it, but also, as I say, being a very good friend. And Peter was a good friend also. They were all very different. Peter had the reputation of being very, very bright, as he was, and so did Mike. But they were they were smart. In, in very different ways. And uh, I think Mike was smart at a lot of different things that you wouldn't necessarily think he'd be smart at. He, he told me one time he could take apart an engine and put it back together with gloves on and not get his hands dirty, you know? And <laughs> knowing him and knowing his love affair with, with uh, vehicles, he was, he was vehicle crazy. I mean, he, he always had all kinds of different cars and motorcycles. And he is a, a singer songwriter who is very uh, cerebral and interested in the world of ideas and philosophy and has a preeminent ability to discuss almost any topic very intelligently, including things like uh, things that are far beyond me, like physics. He knows a lot about physics. 
I mean, he knows a lot about almost every subject you think of. He's uh, truly a polymath. He lived not far from me. He lived in a huge mansion. I live in a uh, <laughs> very, very modest little place. But uh, but we would get together quite often. You know, my Sally, my wife Sally, and and I, and Mike, and, and Phyllis, and we'd have dinner uh, many times. And after dinner, he would get his guitar and sing some of songs he'd written or other songs. Uh, and the the, th- the song I always remember was his singing. Uh, beyond the blue horizon. He was interested in everything, books. He was interested in writing. He was trying to get a, a book written, and we talked about that. We talked about uh, his mother, her very interesting story with uh, inventing liquid paper. But we didn't talk about the show. We had wonderful conversations, many of them, but they weren't about the stuff that had brought us together. I remember one time I was together and talking to Mike, and he was with Victoria at the time, and she was running somewhere, and so we were we were standing around, and I was asking him about any th- songs that he was writing, and he said, well, the songs you write at 60 are not the songs you wrote at 20. What yeah. type of book uh, was he considered writing? Do you remember? Was it a, an autobiography or a book about a subject he was interested in, well, or...? It was not a novel. It was sort of a, a philosophical rap. And it was, if you were a stand-up comic, it would be a, a, a literary version of a stand-up routine, sort of. Did you read any of it, or he just told you about it? I mean, he told me about it, and I read parts of it, and uh, I wasn't crazy about it. I was a huge fan of Mike's, of his thinking, of him personally. But that particular, you know, the, the writing that he wanted to do and was talking about doing didn't really work for me. What did you think of his music, the song? Because Mike wrote a lot of the, the music for the Monkees. What do you think of him as a songwriter and as a musician and performer? I think he's a wonderful uh, performer and singer. I've heard him many times, sometimes solo, uh, some solo concerts, and sometimes the peak for me, it was the first national band. And I, I thought what he did with the first national band was just absolutely amazing. He did a brilliant thing with that band. He had two people in the band that were, one was a guy named Red Rhodes, who played the steel guitar. Not the guitar, but steel guitar. He was the ultimate country western guy. He was a guy that uh, would go to bars and get drunk and get in fights. He was, you know, that mentality, but he was a great musician. He was in the first national band, but there was also a guy, and I can't remember his name right off, uh, I'll think of it, uh, who was a very avant-garde jazz player. And these guys, when they met, I mean, they were culturally opposite. They respected each other musically, and as they played together, they realized, each realized how terrific the other player was in a vastly different genre than, than they were in. It was an amazing experiment anthropologically. What was fascinating was that for years, the monkeys was sort of a forbidden topic. We had a friendship, but the friendship was not a monkeys friendship. And it was a big surprise to me when uh, Lo and behold, he started traveling with Mickey. That wouldn't have happened in earlier years. Anything stand out to you that Nesmith told you or anything about uh, the music that the monkeys were creating, if he was frustrated with it, anything along those lines that you recall? I, I believe that uh, he, he really felt very badly about the monkeys. I think he saw himself as a, a country western singer. And he was hoping to have a career like that. And I believe he, he thought that the monkeys would be a way that he could do that. And when the monkeys turned out to be so radically different, I think it really, uh, it, it's hard to imagine that there's a person in, that, that goes into a show that's where you make a huge amount of money and you're world famous and you feel bitter because you, your career has, has been uh, upturned. But I think he kind of felt that way. You mentioned the first national band. 
But the monkey split. Was Michael telling you that that was his goal, was to put a country rock band together? And what was, did you ever see that band perform? Or do you have any insight into that formation? I did. I saw it a couple of times. I can't remember how many times I saw it. I, but I was hugely impressed by Mike's vision of putting together something radically new on a very solid format. Did Michael express that he was happy, finally happy doing what he wanted to do in that uh, lineup? Mike is always searching. He's, he's always trying to find something. And it, it seems to have, I, I think, often eluded him. On his search, he's done some wonderful things. He did some short music videos with songs that he wrote. One was Rio. Um, da, 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 da. I'm hearing the light from the window. I'm seeing the sound of the sea. And I think I will travel to Rio. Yeah, that would be uh, Elephant Parts. Was yes. The first one. Okay. Yeah. And then there was the one where the little girl where he was driving a Cadillac convertible around the moon. Tonight we're gonna drive the Eldorado to the moon. Gonna... Those were wonderful. They were the next evolution of the music videos. And the Rops were the first in this country. Putting together the first national band, that was, that was visionary. That remains visionary in my, in my thoughts. Oh, it absolutely was. How did he get along with the other monkeys? I know that there were uh, conflicts. What amazed me was that I never felt any conflict with the, with the monkeys individually, but I know they felt conflict with each other. It's a kind of a sibling rivalry. And uh, one would say, well, Davy's more popular than I am. And, you know, this is what one of the things that breaks groups up. I was very conscious that they had conflicts with each other and had disagreements. And I wasn't party to those and I didn't participate in them. And they were just, they were all my friends. What did they think of your scripts? Did they ever come to you and say, hey, you know, uh, Dave, can you do this? Or could you add that? Did they give you feedback on what they want, expected no. from a script or wanted from a script? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I was very in sync with the monkeys. And they loved the scripts, especially Mickey, but they all did. What I was writing was what they were feeling very good about, and so it was a very good mix. You told me you spent quite a bit of time on the set. What was the monkey set like? Bring us to pretend we're what we just walked through the doors at Screen Gems and you're heading for stage seven. The first script that I wrote and that uh, was filmed uh, was the horse script. Uh, I went out when they were filming it, and, and, my, and my wife Sally also went, went with me. I got there, I was sitting on, on the edge of the set, and Rafelson was directing. And every time Rafelson would come to a place, he said, we need a joke here, Dave. And so, although I had the, the full script written with the jokes in it, he kept asking me for jokes from the set spontaneously. I think, I don't know what his thinking was, but and it, and it was fun for me, actually. I didn't spend a lot of time on the sets, but I was frequently on them. Uh, it was just a good feeling. The guys were, as I say, they were always wonderful to me. What was your reaction the first time you saw one of your scripts aired on television? You know, it, it's, it's something you, you, you can't imagine. And uh, Sally said, this is, this is crazy because I just typed up these words that they're saying, uh, it's interesting being part of that, part of that creative process. The show is pretty uh, progressive for the time period. Did you have any censor board or anything that had to go through your script and make sure there wasn't anything in there that shouldn't be on television? Although the monkeys got away with murder in a lot of their scripts, and the Frodo's Caper is obviously a, a good yeah, example. Yeah. But do you remember any feedback from the network? Not so much from the network, uh, but I do remember. It was, it was very much of a generational show in that uh, that was right at the time when hippies were coming in. It was sort of a cultural sea change in the country. And so uh, I had been kind of mentored 
by another writer that was a wonderful guy, Jim Fritzell, uh, who uh, invited me to do a script with him one time. And he was wor working on the Andy Griffith show. Uh, Jim had hopes and plans that I would continue doing the same kind of comedy that he did. He did Andy Griffith and a lot of a lot of those more traditional, very soft comedies, and they were wonderful, and he was very highly honored. Uh, and then when I got on the monkeys, the older writers didn't like the new stuff we were doing, and it focused on the monkeys because that was the, the most radically different uh, way of looking at comedy that uh, it was at that point. So he, he felt that by my writing on the monkeys that I had somehow betrayed him. And, and uh, in a sense, in a sense I had, but that's, that's growth and process and change and, and evolution. And um, that's the way, uh, it's the way life, life goes. Where did you draw a lot of your, I mean, during the week when you were walking around in your daily life, did you look upon things as, oh, that would be good for the monkeys? Where did you draw your inspiration for, for the comedy and the s scenarios that you would create for the show? I, I have a different way of working than, than the other guys on the show did, uh, especially Jerry and D, Jerry Gardner and Dee Caruso. Their idea of a, of a, of a monkey script or, or a comedy script was to take a, a funny generic situation and then they would take this and then they would add jokes to it. They would uh, jokeify it. In the view that, I'm, that I was working on and developing and still work with, I try to make a story that is itself funny. It's funny if you tell the bare bones of it. Now you can then add jokes to it. One of the things that I, I felt very strongly about at the time and do now uh, that I particularly loved about the show, it's a microcosm of humanity and community. And I saw it as a... Uh, it, it's a group where they might uh, fuss at each other and, and, and get ticked off uh, here and there. They, they were all together, and whatever disagreements they may have had in, in the in the context of the show, they were pals. They were one for all and all for one. And I I sensed that at the time, and uh, it it was one of the things I really loved about the show, and I still do. How much uh, oversight was Bob and Bert uh, giving you? during the pro writing process? Did you just hand it in and here it is and they liked it or didn't like it or? Pretty much they... that was, it actually, uh, the funny thing about the, the monkeys was that it ruined me for television. After the monkeys, there was no other show uh, on for, for the next three or four years that gave me the opportunity of duplicating that wonderful writing experience or just that personal experience. I started out at the best possible show that I could be on. Bert and Bob really didn't meddle. I mean, they, they I guess the way to say it, they didn't really, uh, Jerry and Dee uh, did more in rewriting and stuff like that. And, and I don't think Bert and Bob really bothered them very much either. It was an enterprise, not a creative endeavor for them. It was an investment. An important aspect of the show, of course, was the music, and I'm sure they told you that each episode is going to have two songs in it. Did you figure that in? Uh, did you script out the romps? How did you place the songs, and what was the directive for those? Very good. That's a great question. Uh, I uh, really specialized in the romps. We would get a, a you know a script okay, and you know they were they were two act scripts. There was a, a, a about a three-minute romp in the in the first act, and about a three-minute romp in the second act, and there would be a song. I love visual uh, humor. I, I love cartoons. Now we never knew what songs were going to be uh, in the romps, you know, uh, but it wasn't uh, the songs didn't drive the romps because we didn't know what they were, and so what drove for me, what drove the romps was the. Uh, they get in, uh, you know, the castle, and the, and the monster is chasing after them, and so the romp involves the chase. Now you have sight gags in the romps; they have a visual, but they're visual sight gags for the most part. Did you write those ahead of time, or were those improvised? Some of them on the set. I, I wrote them ahead of time. In <clears> fact, <throat> I did some of the romps for some of the other scripts that weren't mine. 
Do you recall uh, in the beginning when the monkeys were first gestating, James Frawley kind of teaching them the ropes uh, or rehearsing them or putting them through the motions about how to do improv and interact yeah. with each other? He did that. I wasn't part of that, but I was well aware that the monkeys would talk, to, talk about what they were doing. And he was, he was teaching them improv. And, and I think when Bert and Bob chose them, they chose people that they recognized had a natural improv ability. And Frawley came from um, the committee, I think it was, uh, an improv group. He, he taught them some of the techniques of, of improv. What do you remember about James Frawley? He was very kind of standoffish. He wasn't part of our group. He was part of, uh, aspired to be part of Bert and Bob's group. So now Bert and Bob handed the, uh, the producership over to World Sylvester for the second season. Yes. You remember that happening and why it happened? And what was working with Ward like? What was he like? Ward was great. Whenever I would get a comment from a producer, it would always be Ward and, and not Bert and Bob. Because Ward was really involved in uh, creatively in being a monkey's producer. Bert and Bob weren't so much. Do you, do you have any uh, insight into the music, the recording of the music, or any the songwriting, the songwriters, or anybody like that visit the set or talk to you about music? What was funny was we had this office up on the second floor of, of this building. And uh, so the writers would be there, and we would see a steady stream of what we thought were very weird-looking people. And they were actually the musicians. And they were there, and they were come in to see have their meetings, and they would see us, and they would think, who are those <laughs> who are those weird people there? And it was us, the writers. So uh, it was two very, very different worlds. And uh, I came to uh, really appreciate, you know, how wonderful the music was because they, they had, you know, all kinds of really great Harry Nielsen and, and you name it. What do you recall about Michael's wife, Phyllis? Phyllis was a very, very smart. And, um, but I think she was extraordinarily uncomfortable. It wasn't a, a kind of a life that she related to. And so uh, she was always wonderfully friendly to us. And, and I remember the only time I've ever had snails in my life to eat was at uh, Mike and Phyllis's. Phyllis was not really a part of it. Was there a lack of privacy issue with the success of the monkeys created for Phyllis, do you think? Well, she was just uncomfortable. I think she was very much more in introverted and, and wanted a quieter life. This was everything but that. As Mike's wife, you know, there were expectations that she would be also living out, you know, his life. And, and, he, and she didn't. She was there. And she was wonderful to Sally and me, but uh, she wasn't really engaged in the life of the monkeys. She was there and she wasn't there. But How I, about I, Samantha, Mickey's girl? Samantha was, was quite wonderful. Uh, Samantha was more able to uh, engage in the life of, uh, of the monkeys than Phyllis was. Now, with the Frodo's Caper script, I believe Mickey and the assistant director, John Anderson, had an idea. How did they bring that to you, and how did you develop the screenplay? He did. He did come with the story, and I think he got part of that story from John Anderson, although he didn't tell me that. So how was the story described to you? What was your reaction to it? you think it was going to make a good script? Well, it wasn't a question of making a good script, because I didn't think that was really possible. But I thought it would be fun to hang out with, with Mickey. Experience to have fun with Mickey. And we did. So was there any veiled attempt to call marijuana Frodus that you were aware of from the outset? Or do you well, not believe that's what it was? <laughs> I don't remember where that started, but it was one of the dominant themes. It was a secret word, though. I, I don't think anybody beyond the show used, that, used the term in that way. Did you know Rip Taylor was going to be cast in it when you wrote it? I didn't, but uh, I had lunch with him one time during the filming, I think it was, or, or sometime right around there. So uh, 
he's a, such an outrageous guy. Uh, so I know I didn't know anything about that. Describe for me what it was like writing with Mickey. How did you guys collaborate? We we collaborated. Uh, I went over there to his house. It was raining, and I took my typewriter because he didn't have a typewriter. The whole time I was saying, now, Mickey, here's the way we do a script. Uh, you know, we, we do this, we do this, and here's, here's how you put it together, and here's what you look for, here's what you try to do. Mickey wasn't open to any of that. He was sitting there playing the clarinet. Now, I have never seen him play the clarinet before or after that script. But that night, in the rain, it, at his place, he played the clarinet pretty much the whole time. And so uh, <laughs> our time frame was, plan A was to introduce him to some of the, the characteristics of, of the screenplay process. And plan B was for me to, uh, when I saw that plan A wasn't going to work, was me to hole up in an office for a day or so and uh, write it out. It was Nicholson's office that I wrote that in. And I wrote it in a day, and he had some things from that original story that he wanted to have in it. And so, do you recall what they I, were? Well, the the fro the, 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 that that's that strange character. This. Yeah, yeah, that that exactly. <laughs> Whatever that was. It looks like it's drawn with a marker, colored with a marker, and on a piece of paper. <laughs> Probably was. <laughs> I think oh. you're right. So you wrote all the dialogue? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, so I said, Mickey, uh, I said, you know, to get a script, we, here are some things we need, and we need to do them in this sequence. You know, there's a certain, there's a certain sequence. You have to do stuff. And, uh, and so he was, just, he was just off and doing other stuff, playing a clarinet and so. And then he went down and showed me the Moog synthesizer, which was amazing, you know. Place with stuff on the MOOC synthesizer. Didn't get anything done that night. So I forget the, what the time frame was. It was really tight. And uh, I ended up, Mickey was filming that day, I think the next day. And, uh, and the next so day? I, I, it was the next day, or I can't remember. It was very, very soon. And it was a day or two, mm -hmm. day or two later. And uh, so I got an office. Actually, they, they I, I can't remember how this happened, but they gave me Jack Nicholson's office uh, for that day. And I did essentially the whole script in one day. We, Mickey and I kind of talked about it, but I, we had to get it done. And uh, So what was the Frodus plant? Did he tell I, you? Well, we knew that was the, the private joke of the monkeys. We knew the term Frodus, and it was, it was widely used by... Uh, no, I've never heard of it outside the monkeys, but it was uh, the monkeys using it. And so I just uh, hurled together a script in a day, and Mickey uh, dro dropped in a couple of times, and we handed it in. And that's the Frodo's caper. Of the scripts that you wrote, do you have a particular favorite episode as it, as it came out? Because writing it and seeing it in its finished form can often change. As I say... Uh, I learned early on not to look at my finished. I'm not sure I've I've actually seen everyone all the way through. I have typically parts of scripts that I like very much, and I like the horse script a lot, and the uh, neighborhood kidnappers a lot, and also the Christmas show. You uh, you have a cameo at the end of that episode. You recall that day when everybody was there and being introduced on camera. You know, you were asking about being on set, and I happened to be there that day, and I had no idea that they were going to have cameos. And no kidding. Well, when I was there, and so they said, no, Dave Evans, you know, and, you know, a, a lot of us were there. I mean, there were many people in that. In were there. all the scripts that you wrote uh, produced for the show? So, oh, there was a, one story that uh, that was that nobody's ever heard about, uh, was when uh, Murray Shishkel, playwright, wrote a play called Love, or uh, L-U-V, I think it was. And it was on Broadway. It did very well. And so they made a movie of it at Columbia. Basically, the story of the play all takes place on the Brooklyn Bridge. 
So uh, for the movie, the main set was this gigantic bridge. I mean, it was it was a bridge of the size of a of a soundstage. It was if you get up fairly close to it, it looks like you're actually on the Brooklyn Bridge. It was amazing. It was an incredible set. And so uh, Ward said uh, to me one day, he said, you know, Dave, we got a great set that we can use uh, and uh, come with us, I'll take you down and show it to you. And so he took me down to the soundstage and there was this amazing bridge. And he said, let's do a script about a bridge. I said, wow, that's, that's fun, yes. It looked like you were in New York City on the Brooklyn Bridge. So I wrote a script. Everything, everything happened on the bridge. Bridge jokes, everything. I mean, the story involves something about the bridge, and I don't remember now any of it, but it was the bridge script. And then uh, I turned it into Ward, and Ward said, wow, this is great. I love it. He said, there is a problem. <laughs> there is a problem. Or bridge. And he said, the problem is that because of some kind of a scheduling snafu, they needed an empty space where the bridge was. They tore down the bridge, and the bridge that you wrote this script for no longer exists. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, uh, so I'll rewrite it. Uh, well, you rewrite something that's all bridge uh, to no bridge. So it, it's going to look uh, very different. I think it's... I believe it's alias Mickey Dolan's. And, and yeah, of course, it's not going to look at all like uh, I first did it because cause there's no bridge. How do you write funny? I mean, as a writer, how, how is it just a gift that you have? Uh, how did you write comedy for the monkeys? It has to be part of you. And you have to be able to write funny and make it work for the context in which you're you're writing. As I say, there are a lot of a, a bunch of people that I have known who are incredibly funny. Now I'll tell you a story about the monkeys. There was a young kid who appeared on the set one day and and met me. He wanted to direct. Well, he was about he was about 18 years old. But Ward had told me he seems to have some directing ability. But the boys boys, the monkeys, uh, hated him because he was so much, you know, they were the young kids, and this new kid that wanted to direct was even younger, so they had a generation problem. Uh, so he hung around and never did get to direct him. His name is Steven Spielberg. No kidding. Yeah. So Steve was around uh, trying to hustle a, a, an assignment. Did Ward introduce you to him? How did you, how did you meet him? I think Ward introduced me to him and said, this is Steve Spielberg. He, he would like to direct uh, the, the monkeys hated it. They were totally against it. And so they, did. <laughs> so they didn't hire him. He, and I don't think he would have been good for it, actually. So when the monkeys won the Emmy, what was your reaction and what was their reaction? And the whole organization, that, that must have come as a surprise. We were amazed. Yeah, I was. I was quite thrilled because it was a show that I identified with it. I felt very good that it was honored. So I was thrilled about that. They eventually made a motion picture uh, called Head. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Was there ever a talk or preparation or ideas being thrown around during the television series that they would make a feature film at any point? That you recall? Well, at one point, uh, Ward had talked to me about uh, doing a, a screenplay for them uh, for a movie. And I said, I'd love to. And I don't know quite how the deal happened, but it wasn't really, in my view, it's not really a monkey's film. I mean, it had the monkeys were in it, but it was, it was Rafelson doing a, a kind of a, a Rafelson art film. It was, it was quite different. But you never actually did any work uh, or take any steps to start a, a monkey movie, movie script. Well, uh, as I say, Ward had talked to me about doing one. And I said, yes, I would love one. And then uh, the next thing I knew that Bob was, uh, you know, doing uh, this other thing. And so, you know, that's, I understand that. Was it discussed what kind of script uh, you would do or with the theme or? My assumption was, when I was talking to Ward about it, that, that it would be a funny, fun script uh, with all the fun of the monkeys. 
but just a larger story that uh, would be, uh, you know, a length of a movie. You mentioned earlier funny. that you used uh, Jack Nicholson's office to write uh, some of the Frodo's caper. What was he doing on the set? Was he friends with Bob and Burr? Did you meet him and talk to him? He was very thick with Bob. They had a, a long-term, strong relationship. Bob liked to hang out with Nicholson. and They went back to another group, the Roger Corman uh, films, and Peter Fonda was there. And There was a group that had coalesced around uh, Roger Corman and his, his way of shooting uh, low-budget, quick movies and uh, often violent and very, very popular. And so uh, Bob and uh, Jack Nicholson were very tight from, from those days. So it was not an accident that Nicholson found his way to the monkey's uh, world, although he was not a good fit. But he found his way in there because he, was, he and Bob were great friends. At the height of the show, how long did you think the monkeys would last? Did you think it was going to go on for a long time? What were your expectations at the, at the time? when they were at the top of the game. I had no expectations. I was loving doing the show. I wasn't really planning, you know, big, big moves beyond that. I had no inkling or experience of, of, of being involved in a project that was so huge, really. Why do you think um, Bert and Bob stopped uh, kind of overseeing the show and producing it directly and handed it over to Ward Sylvester? What prompted that? Well, I think they just lost interest. They weren't they weren't in love with it. I loved it. They didn't love it. And it was for them, it was a startup. They started it up. They wanted to get it going. They wanted to get it making money. I remember, I think somebody told me the story that Bert was standing in, a, in, in the office and said when the last train to Clarksville came on, he said, I just made a million dollars. It was a big money thing. They need. They were invested in getting the show going creatively, but only at the beginning. And once it was going, uh, it was a going thing. It was making money. They're on to the next thing. It's a different mentality than I understand. What was Bob like? It's kind of scary. He was not a friendly guy. He was guarded, and he made you guarded. Uh, I, I remember... Um, I met with him one time in his office, and uh, he said some kind of a critical comment. And he said to me, he said, I'm not just saying this to bring you to your knees, you know. So he, he, was, he was that kind of guy. He was, not, uh, he, was a, he was a tough guy. And when he, was, when he got into directing, he was a guy that would get in, a, in an actual fight with people. Went over, filled with exuberance and energy to the fourth floor and grabbed this executive. Oh, hi, Bob, nice to see you. <clears throat> By the hand, and threw him down four flights of stairs. So how did you find out the show was not renewed, it was canceled, and what effect did that have on you? None, really. It was coming apart the second year, and it was coming apart in the sense that the commitments that the guys had were far beyond what they could actually do. As the music took off, they became more focused on the music and touring than they were on the show. They were sort of just, just sleepwalking through a lot of the second season simply because they were spread vastly too thin. The writing was on the wall early on in the second season. They can't continue this uh, an expenditure of time and effort because it's not there. The second year, everything fell apart, and uh, there was not there was not a disciplined situation for filming. It just got crazy, and the boys were improvising a lot of their lines. Did you make any observations about how things had changed between the first season and the second season? Well, Michael was not focused on the show. He felt very bitter about the show. I don't think he enjoyed it. I think he felt that it was, it, it took him away from an area that where he felt he could be very successful, and, and it, it deprived him of that. Being a, a country western singer-songwriter, 
did you listen to the monkey's music i mean did you ever listen to the, an album from start to finish or did you pay attention to the records as they were being released i did i, I was well aware of them but i was generally around the music enough that i didn't necessarily listen to a record from start to finish i but i but i heard all the songs did you use the Beatles at all as a model for the monkeys or yes they were the model and, and what Bert and Bob did was just very cannily thinking man the Beatles is huge there's a ton of money here and uh let's do an American version of it and that was the high water mark that was what we were aiming to do an American version that was recognizably American but was all that irreverence and fun and just good, good feelings, you know. So, what were your impressions watching the the show of of these four characters? Uh, do you remember what you was going through your mind looking at them? Did you I, see I, it as a Beatles uh, spinoff oh, in any way? Really, that. And in fact, I loved the Beatles, and we saw the Beatles uh, in uh, the Hard Day's Night. I loved it so much that my wife and I went out and danced in the street. Uh, and it was just that reaction. And that's the reaction I had to the monkeys. I thought, this is what I love. I love this show. I love the values of it. I love the fun of it. The craziness, the fun. There was a joyous spirit that just knocked me out. And so I thought, I, I, I definitely want to be involved in this life, this, 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 this whole universe of the monkeys. It spoke deeply to me, and uh, I really loved it. How much of the, you know, the Marx Brothers, Three Stooges, Dead End Kids type films that you saw, how much of that influenced your writing? Well, it influenced it in that I wasn't looking at the structure of those particular pieces. What I was looking at was the effect that the, they created. So I was trying to create a, a comedic effect like they they had in those in those films. Bert was right. Those were some of the best the best comedies that have ever been made. And uh, and I was trying to write like that. Between Bob and Bert, who would you say was the more artistic of the two? Probably Bob, but it's an artistic style that it, it, I don't find appealing. How do they interact with each other? Did they get along? Were they just getting along to go along i think getting along to go along they saw great economic potential and uh, and they uh, they went with it it wasn't a loving commitment to do something wonderful at the heart of real art it's that as an artist uh, you know no matter what the art form is and, and i felt this as a, as a greeting card writer and i consider the greeting card a great literary uh, form. It's like haiku. It just takes everything. It's down to just the, the barest essentials. But I, I remember thinking, I want to write some cards that are wonderful. That's at the heart of the, uh, to my way of thinking, the artistic impulse. You want to do something wonderful. You want to use uh, your, your whatever uh, gifts you may have been given to uh, respond with with something wonderful and that's that's to me what the arts are about was there any topics or subjects or uh, taboos i mean were is there anything you were encouraged or discouraged to include in the scripts uh, politics or is, is there anything that they said stay away from this or yeah we, we really want to kind of sneak this in or was there any subtext that they tried to get through on purpose i don't recall anything like that and, and i say as, as i say that's was one of the things that sort of ruined me for television because in the monkeys it was this the sense that the sky was the limit you're not sure you saw every one of your shows even to this day i'm not sure i have actually did you ever attend one of their concerts i remember one in particular the last one that davy went in and uh, here in los angeles there was some kind of a problem with vehicles or i can't remember now traffic or something it was what they call car megadon they encouraged everybody for a couple of days not to drive it was a problem with uh, with traffic and 
I knew that Davy and Peter and Mickey were at the Greek. So I thought, uh, you know, with this whole car situation, I think I'll, I'll let it go. Anyway, some I told somebody that I wasn't going to go. And I got a call from Davy, and he said, you got to go. You have to come to the concert. I've got tickets for you, uh, and we got parking for you. So you must come, and we want to see you. And so I did, and, and I talked to him afterwards and had a, you know, thanked him. And they were VIP seats. It was just amazing. It was a wonderful concert. It turns out that was the last concert I ever heard because shortly after that, Davey had a heart attack. A book ends in my relationship with, with Davey. The first, he gave me that sweater. Second, he gave me those, uh, you know, insisted that I, that I come, got my, paid for my tickets. So he was very generous. Talking about the Moog synthesizer, what uh, what can you tell me about that uh, that evening with the Moog synthesizer? What did Mickey tell you about it? And uh, do you remember anything about uh, him playing with it? Or he said, "I got to show you what I what I just got." And uh, I said, "What is it?" He said, "Come here, I'll show you." He essentially had a recording studio there. It was highly fashioned. And uh, the Moog synthesizer was amazing. I'd never, I, you know, I'd heard of them. They were new. There weren't very many of them out. He was showing me the things that it would do. And it was, you know, it's, it's an amazing feat of electronics. Did you meet any people or personalities during that era that uh, stood out to you as noteworthy? Well, yeah, the answer is yes. And I can't remember them all, you know. One of the interesting things that happened, this was the era when hippies were emerging as a as a social phenomenon and a, and a social force and uh, so a lot of people in the business were trying to be hippies wanted you to think they were real hippies and stuff like that it's hard to imagine now but there was a sense of people uh, middle class people aspiring to not not so much wanting to be hippies but wanting you to think they were they were hippie like you know and, the freedom of their ideas and, and uh, their their lack of, of constraints and stuff like that. One of the interesting things that happened during that time was there were a couple of guys at uh, Universal Studios. They had a, a, a deal with the studio. They had a certain amount of money. If they could make a movie for half a million dollars, I think it was, uh, and, and if they could make something for half a million dollars, they, the studio would give them the money. So they were talking to lots of writers one of those writers. Now, they they ran their meetings in a very unorthodox way. You know, you'd, you'd go to a meeting and maybe you'd get there 10 minutes early. Well, somebody else is in their meeting finishing up, but they say, oh, go on and you can go into that meeting. So they would mix meetings up all the time. It wasn't like a business like real story pitching as much as a salon. And uh, People came and go. And so I was in a meeting with them. They said, oh, great, Here, here's Charlie. Somebody had just appeared. I think he was there. That's just surprising them. But they invited him in. And what I found out was that it was Charles Manson. And he had three three women with him, all pregnant. And, um, but in those days, Charles Manson went to a lot of Hollywood parties and was trying to make his way as a as a, as a singer songwriter and uh, was, these these producer guys had met him at a party manson showed up and so i spent about an hour with charles manson in 1968. he was extraordinarily charismatic and he was trying to present himself as the ultimate hippie he derided everybody else because they didn't meet his level of commitment in really living the hippie philosophy. So he was telling us that everybody else is what he calls slippies because they weren't authentic hippies, but he himself was a hippie. In fact, he went around and he said, for example, I, I never, I have no ego. And what was interesting was he said he had no ego and he said that several times. And yet what I got as a intuitive person from him was that he had a monstrous ego, but he tried to present himself as not having an ego. And he said, for example, and I never worry about anything. I never worry about money. For example, if I went wanted, wanted around and asked you for money, I know that you'd give me some. And so 
I was I was a little scared of him, so I gave him a dollar, you know. So wow, he was. So I met. So I spent a couple of hours with two different times with Charles Manson. And now, obviously, this was before the murders. So when yeah. you found out that you, about a it year, was later, revealed, I was thinking about you know, just you know just just thinking about different people you meet, and I thought. Whatever happened? I wonder whatever happened to that weird, strange, charismatic guy that I met at, at Universal Studios that day. And the next day, I saw that incredible picture of Manson after the murders. So, so but he did leave an impression on you. He did. Oh, uh, he was I, an indelible uh, personality. So you remembered him, even though he wasn't uh, a quote a famous person at all at that point. Dave, I think we froze. Dave, in addition to your uh, Psychology Today blog, are you working or have you worked on any other projects recently that you'd like to tell the audience about? I had some visual ideas, and I did team up with a guy, and it's the guy that drew this, this book. And uh, I wrote it. I wrote it as a screenplay with the camera shots. I wrote it as, a, as if we were doing a movie. My partner in this in this book, who's in front, uh, was Sherman Labby, who uh, who did the Blade Runner. It's available through Amazon. We worked on it a long time, but it, you know, there was a lot of little little tiny details that change, and and uh, and I finally got it just right, and it's it's now available. I thought to myself, you know, I've written a lot of things for other people. I want to write for myself the funniest project i can think of this is the funniest book I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna check it out and i hope the audience does it sounds really it sounds like a lot of fun and uh i'm very curious to see what makes you laugh since you've made us laugh so much <laughs> is it fair to say that the monkeys changed your life goodness yes in many ways see i started in the greeting card business the greeting card is connectional it's one person to another person in one way or another saying you know I like you. I think you're a good person. And I'm glad you're my friend. And, uh, and so much so that I'm sending you this card. So the, it, it started there. And then to go to the monkeys, it's taking that same frame of reference, same spiritual, that's that same kind of heart. If the four monkeys were sitting across the table from you today, sitting with you, what would you say to them? Well, I would thank them. They were in, in, in the midst of gigantic stresses. I mean, th these guys are, you know, out with a lot of negative people uh, around them. And during that time, they were always wonderful to me. And so I would have to say uh, to each one of them in different ways, uh, thank you for being the, the person that uh, I could be friends with. And thank you for being friendly to me. The big thing would be thank you. And, and how much I enjoyed working with them, and how much I have been blessed by their their friendship. Thank you for uh, allowing me to spend a little time with you, sharing some thoughts that uh, are part of my life and part of my history, part of my my philosophy of getting along better with other people, and, uh, and ideally doing it with a, a song here and a joke there. Joe, thank you so much for the opportunity of sharing these thoughts and this philosophy. Well, and thank you, Dave. And uh, everybody gets along at the monkey's pad at all times. That's the motto here. Yes. So thank yes. you so much, and good luck with the book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that concludes Episode 3 of the Monkey's Pad Show. I'd like to thank Dave Evans for being our guest. Our guest next month will be Bobby Hart. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I'd like to send a shout out to the Zilch podcast and the Monkeys Live Almanac website. Also, a special thanks to Michael Pomerico for technical assistance.
Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.